Hello, it's Eric from Bane Alley Magic, and today I'm talking about 10 tips for building a commander deck. Now, these tips are important to consider for one versus one, but for the context of this episode, we're going to be talking about multiplayer commander. So, tip one, card advantage, ramp, and disruption. If you take away anything from this video, it should be that the three strategies most essential to any commander deck are card advantage, ramp, and disruption. Card advantage means that you have a greater variety of cards to choose from than your opponents. This basically is achieved either by drawing cards or by making your opponents discard cards. Ramp spells either accelerate your mana or allow you to cast spells much cheaper than you normally would. Disruption involves sabotaging your opponents with things like removal, counter magic, and locking them out of the game. In general, I suggest that your commander deck have at least 10 cards that ramp, at least 10 cards that give you card advantage, and around 7 to 10 removal spells. Sometimes I'll have like 14, 15 ramp spells in a deck, and like 12, 13 cards that can give me card advantage. The biggest mistake commander players make when building a deck is that they don't include enough ramp or card advantage. Right away, if your deck is having trouble, double check how much ramp and removal and card draw it has. If you think about the games you've played, ask yourself, how does the winner normally win? If you pay attention, you will see that they are probably drawing lots of cards, they have a lot more mana than everyone else, and it seems as though whatever problems come their way, they always have an answer. A big part of it definitely is tactics, you know, making deals instead of making enemies, knowing when to take action and when to wait, reading every card on the battlefield, and staying one step ahead. But when it comes to deck building, it really helps if your deck has ramp, card advantage, and disruption. Removal is extremely important for any deck as your opponents will inevitably play something that you must remove or it will lose you the game. No matter what color scheme or deck theme your deck is, you must be ready for any type of permanent that can nullify your plans, whether they be artifacts, enchantments, creatures, planeswalkers, or lands. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of different colors and what they will run into when it comes to card advantage, ramp, and disruption. So white decks have an abundance of ways to deal with pretty much anything when it comes to removal. Uh, they have great combat tricks, great creatures in combat, and they have silencing effects like the spell silence here which basically makes it so your opponents can't even cast spells. So it's kind of like the ultimate counter spell. Uh, they have a few versions of that. Uh, the bad thing about white is that it has hardly any card advantage at all. Uh, hardly any card draw. Mentor of the Meek is probably the best card draw spell in white, um, but that also means you have to be playing a token strategy or a deck with uh, low power creatures. And even though white does have some ramp, it's always like circumstantial, like your opponents have to already have more lands than you in order for the white ramp to work. So uh, the white ramp almost always does work because when you're mono white, your opponents always do have more lands than you. Uh, but that's the thing is that it's like you're already behind in the these two really important areas in mono white which is unfortunate but there are ways around it basically using artifacts <laughs> so next is red red can deal with creatures artifacts planeswalkers opponents faces but it runs into trouble when trying to remove enchantments uh red also has some form of card advantage um most of the time, though, it's looting, which can be good or bad. And so it's in both the pros and the cons here, because looting isn't necessarily card advantages. It is just card replacement, right? You end up with the same amount of cards when you're looting. You're drawing cards and discarding that many cards. 
but sometimes if you're playing with a graveyard strategy, that's great because all those cards that go to your graveyard, you can still use, right? Uh, so also there is some, uh, ramp in red, but it's a pretty circumstantial type of ramp, you know, ramp you have to use right away, basically. Uh, but there is also the, uh, Brass's Bounty, which is a pretty sweet ramp spell. Next, we have the green. Uh, green has trouble dealing with creatures, obviously, but it can handle anything that is not a creature. And it has, obviously, the best ramp out of all the colors, and it even has decent card draw. Uh, but yeah, its only problem is it has trouble removing creatures. Other than that, green does everything pretty awesome, but yeah, it's pretty important to remove creatures. What color is really great at removing creatures is black. It's great at dealing with creatures and planeswalkers, but it has trouble dealing with artifacts and enchantments. So uh, black also is great at ramp, card draw, it has the best tutors. Uh, it can pay for things using life. It can make the opponents discard and it can make the opponents mill. So if we're looking at these pros and cons of the colors, black has a lot of just pretty straightforward, obvious pros off the bat. It's pretty impressive. And the cons are it has trouble removing artifacts and enchantments. And one of the cons is the same as the pro is that you got to pay with life sometimes, right? So sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. Most of the time, it's good. And you don't care because if you build your deck right, you have ways to gain that life back anyway. All right. And that brings us to blue. Uh, so blue can hardly deal with anything permanently, but it can return any non-land permanent to its owner's hand, temporarily removing it, and it can also counter any spell before the spell resolves. And it, all, it can also mill. It's obviously the best at drawing. Alright, so let's go on to tip number two. Should my commander deck be competitive or casual? So this question is important because it is detrimental to the playgroup if you're bringing a competitive deck to play against casual decks. Most people seem to play casual commander. Casual commander is what you will normally find when you go to a free commander game night at your local game store. And it's what most of your friends are probably playing. Competitive commander decks are built to tutor, combo, and win as quickly as magically possible using the most powerful cards ever printed. And surprise, surprise, those are also going to be the most expensive cards. Cards that casual players don't even consider purchasing. These include Ancient Tomb, Mana Vault, Karn Liberated, Vampiric Tutor, Yagmoth's Will, Mana Drain, Jace the Mind Sculptor, Wheel of Fortune, Mox Opal, Monocrypt, Drop of Honey, Moat, Bazaar of Baghdad, The Tabernacle at Pendril Vale, and of course the old school Alpha Beta Lands. It's rare, but competitive decks can win as early as turn one or two. Basically, a competitive deck has lots of tutors to find their combo, and lots of ways to protect their combo, and lots of ways to disrupt the opponent's combos. Competitive decks are essentially made for competitions, and there is nothing wrong with that. The only thing I want to address here is that I've been in a lot of situations where people bring competitive decks to a casual setting, and they don't admit that they are playing with a competitive deck. They just show up at casual events and dominate every game. It's like if the Ultimate Warrior went around holding arm wrestling contests against Asian race queens. So listen. If you're running these expensive cards in your deck and you can win as early as turn 3, just admit it, you're playing a competitive deck. And if you've ever watched the YouTube channel Playing With Power MTG, you know that CEDH is just an entirely different game. And you know, it's a game where casual decks don't stand a chance. If you want to build a deck that could potentially win at your local Grand Prix, by all means, build a competitive deck. Just recognize that when you bring that deck to a casual game, you should explain to the playgroup before you start. You should explain to the playgroup before you start. Just explain to the playgroup before you start. I'm not saying you need to give away your entire strategy. Just say something like, hey, just so you guys know, this deck I brought is really competitive and I could possibly win as early as turn four. You explain this because if you don't, 
and your opponents expect a casual game and if you end up comboing off and winning on turn four it's definitely going to make your opponents feel like it was unfair and in the end it was not a fun game i've seen anger and hostility in these situations toward the competitive player which could have been avoided had they just explained that they were playing with a competitive deck an example of one such competitive deck in Commander would be the old Sidisi Undead Vizier deck. Sidisi is a creature with the exploit mechanic, which means she, as she enters the battlefield you may sacrifice a creature. You may even choose to sacrifice Sidisi to her own ability. Sidisi also says that when she sacrifices a creature this way, you get to search your library for any card and put it into your hand. In other words, it's a deck built to absolutely customize the player's hand. Now, I've played against this deck before, so I'll tell you how it went down. Oddly enough, it was what I thought was going to be a casual game. It was at a bar, and they were playing two-headed giant, uh, casual sort of format of Commander. The Sidisi player, let's call him Todd, sneered at me when I asked to join the playgroup. Right? The other guy's really friendly, but Todd looked at me as though I wasn't worthy. So. Todd started by casting tons of mana rocks right away. He was playing mana crypt, grim mana lith, mana vault, and stuff like that. Turn three, more mana rocks, uh, and then Sidisi, whom he sacrificed to herself, and then he tutored for ad nauseum. And so on turn four, he casts ad nauseum and draws like 25 cards and goes all the way down from 40 to 5 life. Then he casts Paradox Engine, and then Aetherflux Reservoir. This is, of course, an old story back before Paradox Engine was banned. So, now, whenever he casts a spell, he gains life and untaps all of his Mana Rocks. So now, he can just cast all of those 25 cards he just drew. The final piece of the combo was Yogmoth's Will, which allowed him to recast all of those same cards again, but this time from his graveyard. In total, he gained something like 156 life with Aetherflux Reservoir, which was enough to zap all of his opponents to death. It was turn four. The other players had done nothing but cast a monorock and maybe a creature, and this guy just combos off on turn four. He takes a 15 minute turn and ends the entire game out of nowhere. And it's a cool combo, sure, but hopefully now you can see why playing such an extremely competitive deck is not as fun to play against in a casual setting. However, I do not believe that ultimate combos are competitive. I think it's completely fine to include a couple ultimate combos in any deck. But it's one thing to have a couple combos, and another to have your entire deck built around tutoring and comboing off ASAP. So to summarize, you should choose whether you are building a competitive or a casual deck. If you can afford the expensive cards that I mentioned, go ahead and build a CEDH deck. Just don't bring that deck to casual playgroups and act like you're the king of the world because other people can't afford the same deck as you. Alright, tip number three is choosing a theme for your deck. If you don't already have ideas on what theme to go with, I would suggest buying some booster packs. Booster packs may not be the budget-friendly means to obtaining the most powerful cards, but to me, the gambling aspect of booster packs makes them the most fun way to get new cards. It's just intriguing to open a pack knowing there is a risk that the cards will not be good, but also knowing but also knowing there's a chance that you could get something really sweet. All the time when I look at my cards and booster packs, I think to myself, I should build a deck with this card in it. So buy some packs, look at some cards, and find a card with a theme you really like and go with it. If you still are having trouble, pick a color combination and research what themes are good for that combination. And even anyway, research what themes are good for your combination uh, just because you want to go with your colors strengths, right? So blue is really good at counter spells for example. So include counter spells in your blue deck. I don't build any blue decks without counter spells in them, right? If my decks have any little bit of green, I'm using that green for ramp for sure. If my deck 
has any white. I'm using that for crazy combat tricks like Teferi's Protection or making all my creatures indestructible or giving them all double strike. Right? So use your colors to your advantage. Use your color strengths to your advantage. And when picking a theme, you want to ask yourself, what makes my deck special? What can it do better than any other deck? And you want to go with that part of your deck and expand on it, right? You want to make sure that your deck is just going off in one area that's just better than anyone else. So if you're like Merfolk Tribal, for example, your deck is all about a bunch of cheap lords, right? Your deck does nothing better than put down a bunch of cheap lords. It does cheap lords better than any other deck. Go with whatever is the, what you think makes your deck special, whatever you think your deck does better than any other, and expand on that idea of the deck. You can have like one other sub idea, uh, but I really don't include more than two themes in a deck. Uh, another mistake people make is they make too many themes for their deck, right? And if you're a new player, I want to give you a warning. And the warning is there are a couple of themes that are difficult for newer players to pull off. And these are aggro and reanimation. Now, aggro decks are all about casting creatures and just attacking the opponent. And the problem is, is that this is normally exactly what every opponent is prepared to deal with. So, if you are not familiar with the game, you will have a hard time breaching the opponent's defenses and actually dealing all of your opponents enough combat damage to finish them off. So, I mean, it is possible to build a good aggro deck, such as with Aurelia the War Leader, but... If you're not experienced with the game, it's easy to mess it up, and so I would suggest just not going purely on the aggro plan. The problem with reanimation is that it's complicated to build a deck in a way where you get real value out of the out of the creatures you sacrifice. It usually requires some knowledge on the powerful graveyard tricks. And I'm not saying you can't do it, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I'm just saying you're gonna have a difficult time making sure that you're not just sacrificing all your creatures and ending up with an empty board, right? You wanna sacrifice all your creatures to get something really cool, to make sure that everyone else has an empty board, or to make sure that you end up with some sort of token army, right? Um, so it, it's just, you, you want to know the tricks kind of before you enter into these two types of strategies, I would suggest anyway. In the end, choose whatever theme best fits with you. Here are some examples of popular themes. So, there's tokens. Making an army of token creatures swarming the board. One of the more powerful strategies because an army of creatures is almost impossible to block, and even if your opponent's board wipe, it's really not hard to recover. I call cards that make tokens board advantage because you get multiple permanents by using just one card. It's also really fun to make your own tokens and play with them. Reese the Redeemed is a great commander choice for this strategy. Burn is a strategy where you're dealing damage to your opponent's faces with spells and hasty creatures. Uh, very powerful in one versus one, but not considered as powerful in multiplayer, but it certainly can be done in the right deck. One of my favorite burn commanders is Perforos, God of the Forge, because it also combines uh, burn with the token strategy. Next is Tribal. This is based around a certain creature type. Tribal decks can be very powerful, but only when they are created from a firmly established tribe. All too often a player will try to build a tribal deck around some creature type that either doesn't have enough creatures or it doesn't do enough with those creatures, right? Those creatures don't have enough of an effect on the game. I would suggest to anyone building a tribal deck to make sure that the creatures themselves can either give you card advantage, ramp, or disrupt the opponents. If your creatures don't do these things, then you'll need to make more room in your deck for other cards that do these things, which means you'll have less room for the creatures themselves, and normally you want to have like 30 or more creatures of the specific type to make the tribe theme worth your time. At the moment, some good playable tribes are humans, goblins, elves, 
zombies, merfolk, uh, warriors, soldiers, wizards, vampires, dragons, knights, eldrazi, spirits, birds, and cats. Some examples of bad tribal decks are moonfolk, cyclops, sirens, hydras. I mean, hydras have gotten okay. You know, maybe a Crufix, God of Horizons Hydra's deck. But I haven't seen the, the super busted Hydra's deck yet. Uh, archers, Gorgons, Werewolves, Badgers, and Horses. Those are all terrible decks right now to build. Uh, it would be really cool, though, if they built a horse tribal commander. You know, maybe something like Kalia of the Vast, but it works with, like, horses, Pegasus, and Unicorns. Something like that. That'd be sweet. I like horses, Pegasus, and Unicorns. They're cool. Uh, anyway, so Edgar Markov is one of the most powerful and fun tribal commanders I have ever played. He gives you a board advantage by doubling the amount of vampires you get, and the vampires themselves have a great deal of card draw and removal. So next we have Enter the Battlefield. These decks are all about Enter the Battlefield effects and making them happen again and again with flicker effects. Uh, so, Brago, King Eternal, and Yarok, the Desecrated, are the best Enter the Battlefield commanders. Next, we have Reanimation, which we already talked about. Uh, discarding your big creatures, and then cheating them out of the graveyard directly onto the battlefield. Super cheap. Uh, Sequar Deathkeeper is a fantastic Reanimation commander, because... When you sacrifice things with Sequar Deathkeeper, you still have a creature token left over at the end. And he also splashes in red, which is great for like stealing the opponent's creatures and sacrificing the opponent's creatures to get cool abilities. Next there's Mill. Uh, put your opponent's entire library into their graveyard, and when they go to draw their next card, they automatically lose the game. In Commander, the Mill player has over 200 cards they need to mill to win the game because they have three opponents. And this is why I suggest mill players also include spells that force all players to draw extra cards, in addition to their spells that mill directly. Spells like Magus of the Wheel and Howling Mine and Jace's Archivist and stuff like that. Great choices. Any wheel spells, right, are probably a lot more effective than a lot of the uh, mill spells. Uh, and that's why I think Nekusar the Mind Razor is a great commander choice for Mill because uh, whom he can't mill out, he can kill through the direct damage, right? Because it's pretty rare in a Mill deck that you end up milling all of your opponents out. You have to have a secondary plan for killing off the remaining opponents who, you know, maybe get to shuffle their graveyard back in their library or things like that. Anyway. And last year we got Voltron. A strategy of a Voltron deck is to have a single creature that can kill the opponent in one or two blows because it is loaded with auras and equipment. So Multani is a great Moltron commander. Multani can get huge. But uh, Voltron in commander also works great with the commander damage effect, right? Because as long as your commander can deal 21 or more points of combat damage to an opponent, that player automatically loses the game. And there are many more themes. There's also discard, land destruction, life gain, extra turns, planeswalkers, infect. You can force your opponents to attack. You can copy instants and sorcery spells. And of course, you can just do infinite combos, right? Just tutor up that infinite combo and you just win the game on the spot. So whatever theme you choose, remember that you want as many cards in your deck as possible that assist and protect that theme and you want as much as possible for that theme to be involved in your other things like if you're gaining life maybe you want your counter spells to also gain you life right if you're gaining life maybe you want ways that you're gonna ramp and gain life uh if you're playing a green black deck you know uh maybe you want a spell that both destroys the creature and ramps you at the same time so uh yeah moving on to number four we have choose your win conditions so with every magic deck you need to ask yourself how do i want this deck to win how do i want it to finish the game 
If you're playing a land destruction deck, for example, there needs to be something other than land destruction cards in the deck so you can finish the game. If you just blow up all the lands on the battlefield, it will only make the game go on forever if you didn't cast some de decent creatures first. So, when a win condition or possible win condition exists within a single card, that card is called a bomb. The most basic example of a bomb is a large creature, uh, which, is, you know, this normally comes from 1v1, where a large creature can finish the game all by itself. In Commander, the bombs are more cards that can kill an opponent all by themselves. Uh, so, in... So some examples of good bombs are Debt to the Deathless, Comet Storm, uh, Luminarch Ascension, Elspeth, Sun's Champion, Ulamog, Ceaseless Hunger, Avenger of Zendikar, Exsanguinate, and Lorthos Tidemaker. Always remember, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Every deck should have a minimum of two different win conditions, but three is better. And it should have several bombs in every commander deck, for sure. So, some examples of good win conditions are commander damage. The rule, again, that says if a commander deals 21 points of damage to a player, uh, that combat damage to a player, even if that player is its owner, that player loses the game. This damage does not need to happen all at once, and normally it does happen over multiple turns. Commander damage is a solid strategy. It's, you know, the only game where commander damage can happen, and you can customize your commander to try to make sure you're killing people with commander damage. Uh, but in multiplayer, it's important to remember that it's rare to kill more than a couple opponents with commander damage. Daragaz is a great commander for winning with commander damage because he just keeps coming back over and over again out of nowhere. Uh, pretty underrated card. Next is cards that say you win the game, such as Approach of the Second Sun or Mortal Kombat or Revel in Riches. Remember, these cards need support to make sure their win, their win conditions are met and that they are not interfered with this. So when you play spells like this, try to also have a counter spell in hand or something like that, something that, that can, you know... Um, reflect a counter spell at least so you can make sure your win condition goes off then there's of course comboing off right comboing off is a perfect way to end a grinding game even in casual right one combo which can go into any deck is the combo with ashnod's altar and nim death mantle and any creature that makes two or more tokens when it enters the battlefield uh, what i got here on the screen is Seki Seasons Guide and Warstorm Surge. Basically, you have Warstorm Surge deal the damage to Seki, which makes eight tokens, and then those tokens deal eight damage spread out amongst your opponents, and then you sacrifice those tokens to get Seki back on the battlefield and have Warstorm Surge deal the damage back to Seki again, creating the tokens again, dealing the damage to your opponents again, and then you just sacrifice those tokens to get Seki back on the battlefield again and just rinse and repeat, right? <laughs> so, after you look, you'll find there are plenty of cheap options for a uh, combo in any deck. Alright, moving along, we got burn. Uh, what's better than burning the opponent's face? Yep, fun. <laughs> then there's aristocrats, a fancy name for draining your opponent's life. This strategy is named after a certain vampire deck that originally used, utilized it. So, basically, aristocrats is about sacrificing creatures, which causes, uh, in some way, uh, one of your cards to deal the opponent damage, and then you recast the creature over and over again, and you just drain your opponents out that way, but you're draining your opponents by sacrificing your creatures, that's the point, and getting the creatures back, and or sacrificing them again, and getting them back just over and over again, and it drains your opponent out and kills your opponents. Alright, next is combat damage. Uh, whether attacking with a big creature or an army of small creatures, dealing regular combat damage is still kind of the most common and powerful of win conditions. Uh, the game is built around it. And you will find a plethora of combat tricks in every color where you look for them. Uh, so, combat is what your opponents are going to be expecting, but if you know that, you know you can triple think them, stay a step ahead of them, and you can make sure that your creatures get through unblocked, that they're not dealt any damage, and that they're just dealing tons of damage to your opponents, and it's a great way to close out the game. Uh, just remember that once your creatures die to a board wipe, 
then you're kind of back to square one when you're with the combat deck. So uh, it's important to hold up those spells like Teferi's Protection and Boros Charm, you know, anything that can protect your creatures. We'll talk about more about those cards later. And then there's Lockout, right? This strategy involves making it so your opponents basically can't play the game. Usually they either can't untap their permanents or they can't cast spells they need to, so they need to constantly pass the turn to the player who will eventually kind of win by default. Not a strategy that will often get you invited back, uh, no, but it, it is a, a, val a valid strategy. Uh, sometimes it makes newer play players mad because it slows the game down a bit. But, you know, once you're in the game for a while, you don't mind that because it is a valid strategy. You know, it's lockout, right? It's just making it so everything your opponents do is more expensive and they end up not being able to cast some spells. And uh, the, the flip side of that is everyone gangs up on you. Right? If you're playing Lockout, everyone's definitely going to gang up on you, just like you're playing any sort of mean deck. Everyone gangs up on you. Uh, but that's kind of the cool part. And I don't know, for some reason it makes you feel good inside. I don't play the Lockout deck myself, uh, but I can understand why you'd want it. All right, so the next strategy, tip number five, choose your lands. It's important to recognize how powerful lands can be. When an ability is on a land, it means that dealing with that ability is much harder for your opponents because they can't counter the land drop with a counter spell and they are often not playing many land removal effects. Lands like Bajuka Bog, Reliquary Tower, Homeward Path, and Gaia Reach Sanitarium are all great examples of lands that will add power to your deck as well as mana to your mana pool. And it's basically like you're getting these effects for free because you're playing lands in your deck anyway, right? You're just replacing a basic land with one of these cards, and it's like you're getting this sort of spell, right, without actually, you know, filling a slot for one of your spells. You're just filling a land slot. So some lands can turn into creatures, they can deal damage, they can even destroy other lands or other permanents. In fact, there are so many lands with abilities on them that there is basically a land card for almost any desired effect. There are lands that can make your opponents discard cards. In Casual Commander, you normally want 35 to 40 lands. Most decks have 37. Statistically, 37 lands means you should not draw too many or too few. You can, of course, have less or more, but you should have a reason for having less or more. For example, competitive decks tend to run so many cheap mono rocks that they only have like 30 lands. Sometimes they have less than 30 lands because they're running like 18 mono rocks, right? Tip number six is protecting your pieces. You want to protect your life total, your permanence, and your spells. This means shields, counter magic, life gain, and fogs. Shields are permanents that can protect one creature at a time, such as Lightning Greaves, Swiftfoot Boots, Alpha Authority, Curator's Ward, and Gift of Immortality. In a creature-based deck, I will include a minimum of three creature-protecting spells, including shields. Shields are perfect for decks which rely heavily on their commander and decks with creature bombs. In those decks, I'll include like five to eight shields. In some decks, I won't even cast my commander until I have a shield on the battlefield ready to equip. Another pseudo form of protection is the sacrifice outlet. Having a sacrifice outlet can prevent your opponent from gaining control of your creatures, making copies of your creatures, enchanting your creatures, and exiling your creatures. If they say, I'm going to cast Rite of Replication and make a copy of your commander, you can respond by sacrificing your commander and Rite of Replication will fizzle, it'll be countered. So even in a deck that doesn't care about death or the graveyard, I will still often include one or two sacrifice outlets. The only time I don't include any sacrifice outlets are with decks where I'm already playing a lot of counter spells or maybe a deck that just has hardly any creatures. In a deck that cares about death and the graveyard, I'll maybe have like five or six sacrifice outlets. And some good choices are Greater Good, Ashnod's Altar, Phyrexian Altar, Thermopod, Culling Dias, Viscera Seer, Vampiric Rites, Birthing Pods, of course, we can protect our permanents directly with spells like Teferi's Protection and Boros Charm. I'll often include two or three of spells like this in any deck that relies heavily on creatures. Now let's talk about protecting our life total. Many decks get 
hated out very quickly because they are so powerful. Some of these include Perforos, Nicol Bolas, Heartless Hidetsugu, Kalia of the Vast, and Rurik Thar. If your deck's main theme is based around mill, hand destruction, land destruction, counter spells, burn, infect, lockouts, or any sort of collective kick in the balls strategy, the chances are your opponents will gang up on you and kill you as soon as possible. And in a game of three versus one, you can go from 40 to zero life in a single turn cycle. So preventing the damage in the first place can be more powerful than gaining life and is less likely to make you a target also because when you gain a bunch of life it makes you the target so spells like Teferi's Protection, Sandworm Convergence, Ghostly Prison, Propaganda and Fog Effects are great examples just preventing the damage as far as gaining life goes I go to Crypt, Condur uh, Crypt Incursion, Whip of Erebos, True Conviction, Congregate Courser of Crew Fix and Gnaw to the Bone. Red and blue spells don't have many, or I don't know if they have any ways of actually gaining life in red or blue, but they do have ways of preventing combat damage, such as Disrupt Decorum and Downsize. In any commander deck where I play a hated commander, I almost always include Glacial Chasm and a ton of shields. And just talking about hated cards in general, uh, you should also just consider how hated a card is. Uh, it's something that no one really considers in multiplayer. We always talk about how powerful a card is, right? Uh, like the Immortal Sun, right? The Immortal Sun is such a powerful card because it has so many abilities on it. But that being said, in a four-player game, it's going to be the target for your opponent's removal spell. No problem, right? As soon as they play Decimate or you know, any sort of artifact removal spell, they're going to be pointing it at your Immortal Sun, right? So, I feel like sometimes uh, you think about, okay, what did I put Immortal Sun in there for? Mostly for the ramp aspect, let's say. Maybe I should replace it with another ramp spell. Or maybe you like it because it's both ramp and card draw. Well, there's plenty of other spells that are both ramp and card draw that aren't going to be nullified within the turn that you cast them like the Immortal Sun is going to. So I just want to say, keep that in mind. If a card is too good, it's going to get hated out. And so you need to have ways to either protect it or you should consider replacing it with something that's maybe not as good, but that is going to be guaranteed getting you results and maybe even going to save you in mana cost, right? Because when something's not as good, it's going to be cheaper to cast, right? All right, so moving along to tip number seven, consider haste. So it's important to decide whether your commander needs haste or not. In a lot of ways, haste is like skipping ahead a turn. Most creatures can do nothing but block until your next turn, but with haste, you can tap and attack right away. In a four-player game, cards like Heartless Hidetsugu and Ulamog Ceaseless Hunger will usually get exiled before they are put to good use, but with haste, they can be utilized right away. You get a combat step you normally wouldn't get, and you get to activate abilities you normally wouldn't get to activate, so that's why I say it's like skipping ahead a turn. It's like a combat version of ramp. Any commander that taps to activate or triggers during combat should be given a multitude of options for haste. Some of my favorites are Hall of the Bandit Lord, Flamekin Village, Handweir Battlements, and Anger. So next, tip number eight, consider power cards. So two heads are better than one, and it's better to have spells with multiple effects over those with just one effect. I call these power cards. You should try to include power cards whenever possible. They're, and I have put these into three categories, which I've made it myself. These types are flexible, functional, and repeatable. Flexible cards are cards with multiple options. Functional cards are cards that can do multiple things. And repeatable cards are cards that can have their effects repeated multiple times. And of course, there are cards that, you know, bleed over into each category. Some of them just do one, some of them do multiples. So, some examples of flexible cards are the command spells like Astir Command and uh, Atarka's Command. 
And then there's the Fuse spells, Charm spells, Confluence spells, and Planeswalkers. Again, these flexible cards give you choices. Some functional cards are Solemn Simulacrum, Confluence spells, Command spells, Aftermath spells, Adventure creatures, Planeswalkers, Vindictive Lich, there's Death Sprout, Far Haven Elf. Again, functional cards do multiple things. Some examples of repeatable cards are flashback spells, buyback spells, retrace spells, jumpstart cards, and again, planeswalkers. <laughs> you can repeat planeswalkers abilities over and over again, right? So planeswalkers are examples of spells that are functional, repeatable, and flexible, uh, but they also die really easily in combat. So often, you're paying the mana cost for a Planeswalker to get just one of their abilities. So Planeswalkers, they're really not as good in Commander. And even in a Planeswalker deck, God, I hate playing against Planeswalker decks because they just take forever. There's just so many options. They're, that's the problem. There's just too many options. So Planeswalker decks are really good, but they're just also, they drag the game out really long. So be ready for that. Anyway, so these power cards, they're great to include in your deck because they can fill multiple slots in your deck list. And basically, they generate card advantage by allowing you to do multiple things with one card. So Death, Death Sprout, for example, it's an instant speed removal that also ramps you. That's two cards in one. So on to tip number nine, write it down. I can't tell you how much this has helped me in building decks and saving me time. Writing down your deck list before you build the deck will help you keep your theme in focus and choose what cards you really need in the deck without including a bunch of fluff. The other method many new players use to build a deck is to go through every card they own, selecting all the cards that might work and putting them into this giant mountain of cards. The issue with this method is you usually end up with a pile of 300 or more cards that you need to organize and trim. Writing a deck list down first, however, keep your deck idea in focus and it'll it's kind of just like going backwards it's going from the opposite direction instead of going through every card you own and trying to discover new cards write down the cards you already know are going to work really well with the deck and you might find just by doing that you already have enough cards so the example i have here is my zakama competitive deck that's right i've tried to build a competitive deck at least i wrote down the idea for the competitive deck i built the deck uh and with more casual cards and man it's still competitive oh my gosh it's still just infinite combos like so quickly zakama is such a broken deck i'm surprised more people don't play it in the competitive setting anyway so anyway when i made this deck list i i just wrote it down without going through any of my cards without piling up a mountain of cards and uh, I wrote down what I wanted the deck to do. So, what does this deck do better than any other? It nullifies artifacts and locks down the board until we can combo. And the reason that's what we want the deck to do is because, well, that's what competitive decks are doing. They're always running artifacts, right? So I want our deck to nullify artifacts. And I want to lock down the board so our opponents can't combo. And I want to lock it down until we can combo. Then I wrote down the win conditions. What are the different ways this deck can win? And I came up with like seven different ways in the actual paper version of the deck. I've got like maybe five different ways to win. Um, but you'll see here, I just made a list of, you know, how, how can I expect this deck to win the game? Uh, next, how do we make infinite mana? And that's just another important aspect of the deck, right? The deck wins through infinite mana. You'll see in the win conditions, a lot of them say infinite mana plus this spell, infinite mana plus uh, Perforos, right? Infinite mana plus Zakama plus Perforos. So anyway, how do we make infinite mana? I've got a list of five different ways we could make infinite mana. And then if we look on the right side here, we got the rest of the list. So I got the different sections and this is also really important, just writing down how, uh, the numbers. So I started with the with this different categories I knew had to be in the deck. I knew I needed sacrifice outlets, I needed removal, I needed ways to lock down the opponents, I needed tutors, I needed counter spells, removal, draw, ramp. And so anyway, next to all those categories, I also wrote down how many 
I expected to need in the deck. Before I even selected what counter spells were going to be in the deck, I wrote down, I think I'm going to want seven counter spells. And if you just think about it like that, it's going to put you in focus so much, right? Because even then, if you know I only want seven counter spells, then when you're digging through every card in your deck, you're only going to put like seven aside instead of putting like 20 different counter spells aside. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. That's an example of how I write down my deck, and it is a really great way to build your deck. All right, so on to the final tip is number 10, research, review, and revise. So keep doing what you're doing. Check out your commander on websites like Scryfall, Tapped Out, MTG Top 8, EDH Rec, and YouTube. Let's check out Scryfall's advanced search engine real quick so I can show you guys how to use it and search up cards you're looking for. So this is Scryfall's advanced search engine. The first line here is for if you already know the card name. The next line is to search the rules text on the card. You could put quotes around certain words you want to group together, such as deals damage, or maybe enters the battlefield. The third line is where you can narrow the search by card type. If you click in here, it will give you a drop down with basic card type choices, but you can also click in there a second time to type in a specific card type, such as vampire, like I did here. You can also change the green is button to a red not button by clicking on it and doing so will make sure to not include the not types in the search results so right now if we search like this we are going to be searching for creatures which are also enchantments but are not vampires below the type line is the allow partial type matches checkbox if we have this checked we will be searching for creatures and enchantments but they will not have to be both Next is where you can limit the search by colors. The important thing to understand here is the drop down menu. It's automatically set to exactly these colors. You'll see I've selected white, blue, and black. So if I search with the color combination selected like this, I would only be searching for cards which include exactly white, blue, and black, and no other colors and no less. They'd have to include all three. If I selected including these colors, it would search for cards with white, blue, and black, even if they had other colors too. If I selected at most these colors, it would search for all white, blue, and black cards and cards with any combination of those colors. So that's a quick tutorial on how to use the Scryfall search engine. I'm on here all the time looking for new cards that do strange things. So every deck needs a periodic review. Play a few games and reflect upon what your deck did well and how it can improve. Also consider if your playstyle was actually to blame. Consider are you maybe being sentimental about a card that doesn't do you any good. If your deck seems like it never wins, you may need to discard your playing completely and start fresh. But keep in mind that sometimes the deck itself is not the problem, it's the person piloting it. In other words, you may not be playing the deck in a way that maximizes its value, so be sure to read your cards multiple times before you play with them, and when things go wrong, be sure to ask yourself how could you have played differently, and whether or not you should have kept your opening hand, and whether you should have played this spell earlier, or whether you should have countered this spell instead of this other spell, you know, things like that. What could you have done differently? Remember that even experienced players make mistakes all the time. And finally, you must revise. You must make the appropriate changes. Take out the cards that never work or that will never get cast. I personally allow myself one sentimental card in every deck, right? I will allow myself to play just one card that is in there just because I think it's cool, right? But no more than one. So that's it that's all for today folks those are my 10 tips on building a commander deck so let me know what you think uh, do you, if you like this video please like or subscribe uh, give me some other commander deck building tips in the comments below this is Eric from Bane Alley Magic signing off until next time take care take it easy